Some years ago, I started gathering material for a book, which has not yet been completed, on the philosophy of art as impulse and impact. And it is more or less along the lines of the research for this work that we wish to present our case this morning. First, however, I think it would be generally useful to recognize a certain essential difference between the intellectual and emotional life of the human being. <coughs> We have a common belief or a popular opinion that man is governed largely by his intellect. In actual experience in the daily process of contact with other human beings, we gradually realize that this is not true. Most of the faults which we attribute to the mind arise actually within the impact involved and complicated structure of man's emotions. The emotional content in man's psychic nature is far older than his mental content. <laughs> the mind seems to attain uh, the estate of a conditioned state of the emotions. And that which is accomplished by the mind is always directed and dominated by the pressures of the emotions. Thus when we say something about an individual, presumably disparaging to his mind, we nearly always are actually attacking his emotions, although we really do not understand or appreciate this fact. For example, when we say an individual is selfish, we may be referring to something in his philosophy, but we are actually accusing his emotions. When we say he is dogmatic, it is the same. When we say he is narrow-minded, it generally means that he is bigoted, and bigotry is an emotional pressure. Uh, when we say that he is arrogant, this is emotion. Ambitious, also emotion. Fearful, belligerent. Uh, when we say that even that he is argumentative, we are largely telling others and ourselves that under the pressure of emotional excitation, he unreasonably defends his point of view. All of these pressures are in themselves emotional forces, coloring, conditioning, specializing, and to a degree perverting the natural course of thought. Let us also realize uh, that while we may say that a person is an intellectualist, we are really hardly appreciating our own remarks. A person who is a complete intellectual, it would be as difficult to discover as a person complete in any other respect. Actually, if it would be hypothetically possible to discover an individual completely and entirely dominated by his mind, and this mind in complete rulership over his life, we would have a person in a state of complete and entire non-action. In other words, he might not be any good to anyone, but so far as his mind is concerned, he could not be of any harm to anyone. <laughs> because he would live completely in a non-energized state. He might spend his whole life adding two and two together and making four. He might have certain theorems which were inflexible and inevitable, but he would recite them tonelessly, without meaning, without purpose, without reason. He would simply be a completely thinking creature. But if he was a full and entire intellectualist, he would be thinking without motive. And to think without a reason for thinking, without some dominant purpose, is unthinkable in itself. So why does he think? He thinks because he wishes to gratify some emotion, some instinct, some attitude. If his business is an intellectual business, 
he may be thinking in order to supply the needs of his family, which in turn satisfies his emotional content. If he is an explorer or discoverer, he may be thinking in hope of fame, of distinction, of becoming outstanding, victorious, of being a pioneer. All of these emotional pressures. Or perhaps he may be thinking in, the order, in order to be of service to others, to advance the general state of knowledge, for patriotic reasons. He may be thinking because he believes that the work he is doing is of signal importance to others. But the moment he states the fact, I believe that what I am doing is important, he is on the level of emotion. So that the pure and complete intellectualist is just about unthinkable. He cannot exist because he can do nothing unless he is pressed to this accomplishment by some feeling, by some desire, some aspiration or ambition. In other words, he must have energy. And the energy for thought is all supplied by emotion. And without this energizing factor, the thought itself is meaningless. Therefore, in practical experience, man uses his mind principally to sustain his emotional purposes, to achieve their fulfillment, and for various emotional satisfactions within himself. Now, in the ancient Greek uh, psychology and symbolism, all of the arts and sciences were personified as the muses. And the muses were all female figures, although they had rulership over the most exact intellectual departments of life. And above them all, and superior to them all, as the principle of wisdom itself was Pallas Athena, also a feminine de deity as the complete embodiment or personification of wisdom itself. Thus these ancient people seem to have recognized uh, that the entire emotional pattern, the emotional pressure in man, is the cause and the nourisher and the sustainer of what we call intellect. Now in the field of arts, which are of course under the patronage of great muses, according to the classical way of looking at these matters, we come into a world of inspirational values. Arts are essentially emotional expressions. And in the case of the arts, rather than in that of the sciences, an art differs from a science primarily in the dominance of its pure emotional content. A science is a form of knowledge that has been integrated and organized to the degree that it has been placed upon an experimental basis. And on this basis, certain causes set in motion always and inevitably produce certain results. Therefore, we consider the sciences to be the most exact forms of human knowledge. The arts, however, spring not from these exactitudes primarily, although many arts, because of their involvements in sciences, finally become highly accurate, as in the case of music. Arts in themselves are expressions, expressions sustained by a universal admiration rather than by some exact formula of acceptances. Admiration itself is a highly emotional state, but represents one of the most sublime, altruistic, and unselfish of man's emotional forces. Art has been cultivated from the beginning of time, and we often come to mistaken ideas about arts as well as about other forms of learning. We can see, perhaps least abstractly, that someone somewhere sat down and discovered art. Such is not the case. Art is a universal appreciation that is released through man and has been since the beginning of time. There have been many artists, but no human being has ever dominated art, has ever been able to capture art and hold it and to separate it from the lives of other persons. Art is therefore a universal force 
a powerful ministering agent in the life of the human being. The primary manifestation of art as we know it was the art of release. The individual became an artist through the gradual determination arising within himself to place the mark of himself upon other things around him and to gradually organize his environment into a symbol or likeness of his own nature and instinct. Art, therefore, according to the Neoplatonists and to many other mystical groups, represented man's effort to play God. It was his effort to place upon his world the mark of a higher order of understanding or a greater integration of beauty than was otherwise possible. The Hermetic axiom, therefore, reads, Art perfects nature. The artist in any field, therefore, is one who was attempting to aid and assist the natural operations of the universe, or to make these operations more manifest, more obvious to others, in order that others might, through this realization, uh, worship or understand or appreciate more fully. Man cannot actually, of himself, improve upon the divine plan. But this plan, working upon nature and through nature over vast periods of time, has produced out of itself certain apprentices or beings possessing power to cooperate with nature, either through understanding, through admiration, through inspiration or intuition. Thus all that the artist is doing is revealing nature or cooperating with nature in the release of nature's own ways, purposes, and patterns. It was therefore of an early time that man conceived himself to be a gardener in a great world garden. It was not his privilege to bestow life. He could not give life to the seeds in the earth. He could not require the harvest. He could not, by a wave of his hand or a magic wand, cause the desert to blossom as a rose. Nature had to do these wonders, but man could help. Man could bring water to the desert so that it might blossom. Man could weed the garden so that the good plants and the purpose grow could have an opportunity. Man could also arrange the flowering and planted things in patterns peculiarly pleasing to himself and therefore to his estimation pleasing to everyone else. Man was also able uh, to encourage the life of growing things by supplying them a suitable environment, by keeping them well fertilized, by keeping the soil soft and cultivated above them. Thus man could help. He could not bestow life, but he could conserve it. He could direct it and aid it. He could do for all things in nature that which theoretically he would like to do for his own child. Bring these things into maturity uh, with less difficulty than they would otherwise experience. So art became the handmaiden of the law. It became an instrument by which the works of the eternal were revealed to man, by man, in a more sublime and wonderful way. Art as architecture began building magnificent shrines and temples to man's worship. Art as music brought the great masses and the wonderful litanies to the church and to all phases of man's aesthetic uh, enjoyment. Art even in such fields as astronomy and psychology brought wonderful revelations of the universe. But art most of all produced a tremendous impact upon persons beholding it or those coming immediately or directly under its influence. Thus in man himself art is impulse. It is his own release of the patterns divine and human that are locked within his own soul. Art as impact 
is the reaction of this tremendous revelation upon other persons who receive into themselves a strong and pressured and conditioned reflex as the result of artistry as it is expressed through great creative ability. We often wonder who taught the great artists. We know, for example, that these artists had their schools and workshops where they instructed others. But who taught them? Who taught Michelangelo and Leonardo, Raphael and Titian, Rembrandt and Van Dyck? Uh, they dominated the schools of their times. And while they may, some of them, have had some instruction from other masters, we know that they did, they so excelled that instruction that they became dominant figures in the world of art and became teachers even though we cannot remember that they were ever students. This means in some way that these human beings were in rapport with a certain level of beauty within themselves and had the magnificent coordination of emotions and faculties and powers by means of which they were able to express this creative attitude or creative impulse in a manner uh, suitable to excite the profound respect and veneration of those around them. So art comes to us out of the human being. It is something that the artist must do. It is something that he must give into, accept, and recognize that he is dedicated to this particular activity. Thus for him, art is a natural expression, and it loses its value only if he as an individual is not so emotionally constituted. If he is learning art merely in order to make a living, if he is training a mediocre talent in order that he may have certain personal satisfaction, then actually he is not a great artist. But if this art bursts through from within himself as a pressure which he cannot resist and which he must live to fulfill through his own action, then we are in the presence of the potential of artistic excellence and in the shadow of a great genius. The average person is not a genius in any art, but still he has art requirement within his own life and nature. And therefore, just as surely as every part of the human personality must be brought into constructive expression if health and happiness are to be enjoyed, so each person to some degree and in some measure must express himself through creative artistry of some kind. <clears throat> where this is completely blocked, where the individual is not permitted to manifest this dimension of his own psychic life, he is impoverished. The more so and especially so because the natural structure of the psyche itself is art. And as the Greeks and Egyptians so well pointed out, the release of the beautiful through man is the release of his own soul. If, therefore, he is deficient in this release, or has never found some way to express these creative instincts within his own nature, he is definitely impoverished, and the probability of normalcy for him is thereby reduced. This is especially important because the pressures by which we become psychotic the pressures by which our eternal life may be seriously disturbed with most disrupting results upon our physical body, these pressures are from the emotional level or from the level of the arts. Therefore, the art instinct and the mastery of the concept of art is to a certain degree an emotional discipline. It is a discipline by which the emotions find constructive, reasonable outlets and are thereby prevented from unreasonable attitudes and activities. So we will consider first art in its nature as impulse, the impulse of the individual to reveal himself. 
he will not perhaps define this as self-revelation. He may think that he is revealing a cosmic quality through his own nature. But actually, art is the individual's own psychic integration or entity moving out into expression along lines of beauty and release. If, therefore, we consider this matter carefully, we realize that there are many arts which can be practiced to the benefit of the person. These arts may include any way by which man releases himself. Whereas the most of our so-called intellectual attainments are those of accumulation. Therefore, accumulations are static until they are vitalized by a dynamic within us. And whatever our mental accumulations may be, they depend upon our internal psychic stimulation for their usefulness, for their application in spheres of specialized endeavor. Therefore, the individual, no matter how learned he may become, remains static, remains comparatively impotent and sterile until his own aesthetic or artistic soul and souls his reason, gives purpose and direction to his intellect, and causes him to be a creature with purpose. So purpose comes from this psychic integration. A man's purpose is no truer, no wiser, no better than the degree of wakefulness which has been attained within his own soul. The soul which is awake purposes the mind to constructive action. The soul which is not awake, which is not matured, which has not oriented and integrated itself, cannot bestow this purpose so that the intellectual and material lives of the person become sterile. How then can we express these creative instincts within our own natures? Usually first by recognizing that they are necessary. And this necessity has been clearly brought to our attention in recent developments along psychological lines. We know, for instance, the present technique of asking those under treatment for various ailments to draw, paint, sketch, or variously make pictures of their own pressures, or to make pictures without any obvious or conscious purpose recognizing that gradually the psychic pressure in the individual will take over and cause the picture to become a representation of his own need. This is one of the important modern forms of diagnosis. And as diagnosis is, uh, is two-thirds of the remedy, you can recognize its importance. It is further important because the patient himself, consciously and objectively, cannot usually give this diagnosis. He may be questioned repeatedly, but because of the highly conditioned pressures of a neurosis within him, he is unable to indicate the cause of his own trouble. Therefore, it is usually easier for this cause to be revealed than defined. And through the expressions of his own creativeness, this cause is revealed. Now let us uh, pause for just a second and generalize this, because it is important to us today. Uh, statistics available and studies made in recent years indicate that to the degree that we find rising pressures of psychic intensity, we find lowering standards of aesthetic achievement among a people. For example, today, we are comparatively without aesthetic integration. As a result of that, we are the most miserable people, probably, in the history of the last thousand years. We find that to the degree that our minds and our emotions become locked on levels of utility, we begin to get sick. We observe also today less and less appreciation for what might be termed pure art values. 
we find even the artist himself utterly confused. We find him torn between his emotions, the emotions of sincerity and the emotions and the emotion of profit. We find him compromising his own God-given talents in the effort to please persons without ability or discrimination and thus be a successful artist. We find also that in most arts today there is a dominant confusion. Uh, we blame the artist. We sometimes blame the critic. But the one person we do not blame and should blame is ourselves. We can and could easily change this situation by a distinct stand as human beings. We can demand what we wish and we will get that which we demand. Our own indifference, our own uncertainty and confusion upon an emotional level all these prevent us from a clear statement of our own desires or a clear conscience uh, for the support of that which we honestly and naturally believe to be right. While this confusion exists, we will have the present difficulties. The average home today in America has little, if any, consideration for art. Uh, beyond perhaps a rather superficial effort uh, to make a pleasant or colorful environment. I was talking to a man not long ago who had furnished an apartment. Uh, it seemed to me that his brand new overstuffed set was a little out of place in the pattern. The rest of it was not bad, but this sort of didn't look quite the way it should. So I asked him, I said, how did you happen to pick that particular shape and that particular upholstery? Well, he says, I'll tell you. I really didn't like it myself, but I got it for $49 off. <laughs> and to a degree, $49 off or buying it wholesale or 10% discount to the trade determines more or less our environments today. Obviously, we must economize. But if our instincts were as strong on an aesthetic level as they are on the level of our economy, we probably would search a little longer and finally discover at the same economy something that was suitable. But we do not think it through that far. We do not realize that we live within a pattern that is forever moving in upon us. And that to the degree that this pattern is not thoughtfully arranged and not well integrated, it will and does have a detrimental effect upon our own living and thinking. <coughs> Very often we become so accustomed to this detriment that we lose sight of it entirely and are only reminded of it when we discover that the environment no longer as furniture and fixtures, but as what we like to term home, is not especially attractive to us. We find that the atmosphere, or the psychological level of home consciousness becomes more and more deficient. And we do not know what to blame or who to blame for the nervousness, the edginess, uh, the lack of compatible understanding which springs up in these environments. A good many of these problems are simply due to these environments, which have not been properly considered and have not been arranged with a due regard for artistry, for the creation of, an, of a setting that not only satisfies the individual, but is to a degree a stimulation upon him for further progress. Sometimes his environment is a little better than he is. This is good because it will make him stretch and grow. But if his environment is less ordered than himself, then it will inspire him only uh, to a decline or will impel him to lose 
something that he has already achieved in the form of character integration. <coughs> we can say, of course, that the individual would naturally choose to be surrounded by that which is expressive of his own nature. Therefore, is it possible for an environment to be inconsistent with the person living in it? It would not be possible if man was aggressively an individual in the sense of taking a dynamic attitude toward things. But as he moves about from one rented apartment to another, as he gradually moves what furnishings he has into one environment after another, he gradually loses domination over his own patterns. He becomes accustomed to things which are not really pleasing to him. And becoming thus accustomed, he loses the keenness of his own insight. And once he has dulled this, once he has denied himself, or perhaps denied himself many times, he is capable of creating an environment that is inconsistent with his own nature. If his nature is strong and insistent, however, he will gradually and relentlessly change this environment. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why so many people move today from one place to another. They are dissatisfied uh, with the highly stylized, highly mechanized, highly materialistic uh, efficiency of establishments. There is no longer any life, any individuality, any dynamic. And the individual becomes bored and seeks uh, uh, some other escape mechanism often of a destructive nature. Another particular specialization with this, within this is the gradual disappearance of art in the term of efficiency. And we have one or two points to make uh, on this subject. And that is the comparison between the Rococo furnishings of the 19th century and the streamlining of the 20th. Essentially, the value does not lie in these two arbitrary definitions. Probably if the truth were known, the simplicity of modern furnishing is in many respects an advantage over the older, involved, complicated mass of dust catchers that plagued the last century. There is no question but that simplicity has dynamic, if that simplicity is good. But all simplicity is not good, any more than we can say that all complication is bad. There must be a certain artistic or aesthetic integration. And where the natural and basic furnishings of a modern home are extremely geometrical, having practically no obvious ornamentation, depending either upon the color of natural woods or things of that nature, for their cleanness of life, and depending very heavily upon mathematical proportion for their satisfaction within the consciousness of the individual. We have perhaps in the house today a series of excellent foundations, excellent pedestals, for the use of the individual in creating his own artistry. Against these neutral backgrounds of geometric structure, the individual is capable of expressing his own foreground interests. And therefore, it becomes even more critical for him to decide how he shall enrich and how he shall ennoble and bring warmth uh, to these austerities, because austerity in itself is neither a vice nor a virtue, but on the level of art it is always encouraging the individual to bestow something from himself to enrich and ennoble it. Thus where we have these highly traditional, highly conventional forms as we have them today, there is nearly always a pressing demand for the presence of well-chosen, highly integrated art. And we have made an interesting discovery 
namely that these very simple household designs with which we are becoming more and more familiar are extremely neutral and give opportunity for the mingling of art schools in a manner not possible under the more uh, highly complicated forms of traditional furnishing and fixture. When you had a Louis XIV chair or a Jacobian sideboard, you were more or less forced to build around these dominant pieces a compatible atmosphere. And little by little, you became a traditionalist in furnishing. Today, however, there is no such stylization. If anything, modern furnishing is moving gradually towards certain oriental schools. And I believe that the Japanese home furnishing concept has taken a deep and powerful hold on the American imagination. In any way, the simplicity of the present furnishing makes it possible to blend with it almost any form of artistry which is pleasant, happy, and compatible to the owner of the establishment. We thus have today a wonderful opportunity in the home of blending East and West as schools of ornamentation and artistry. We will find that in the modern home with its most tailored and most highly specialized furnishings, that Oriental art is most effective, that Greek art is effective, that Egyptian art is effective, that the fine old masters of Europe, the Gothic art, all of these fit magnificently, and they work together in an astonishing way, so that the person is perfectly able to bring, bring together and even mingle many schools of appreciation. These schools give him a warmth, give him an understanding, and give him great opportunity uh, to reveal his own nature. It is therefore rather depressing to find that the majority of individuals do not accept the challenge offered by these things. Uh, they are satisfied with mediocrity in the form of a lamp and a pair of bookends. They are not inspired uh, to fulfill uh, the challenge of these wonderful pedestals upon which the individual could place the objects of his own understanding. Thus we have great need for artistry today uh, to help to build better homes, better families. But while the utilities may be supplied by firms and uh, houses specializing in these things, they must be arranged into a highly personal pattern by a dominant individuality. Speaking of dominant individualities, I know a very wealthy man in this community who tells me that he has never been in his own front parlor because he is overwhelmed by it. He didn't furnish it himself, it was a sort of a family deal. And when it was all finished in its lavishness and its splendor and its magnificence, the poor man had an inferiority complex every time he went in. In other words, he was completely dominated. He had no sense of being able to create something himself within this environment. It just moved in upon him. And this can happen also if we believe all it says in the books on furnishings. That we should like this, that we must appreciate that, and that we are a little better than morons if we do not choose a certain type of thing. All these pressures prevent the individual from being himself. And perhaps they say to him, while he has no self that he wishes to express, but if he has a dynamic, uh, he should release into his environment, fulfilling the things which he believes to be necessary for his own peace, happiness, and intellectual moral security. So much of that field, and we go into others. In the field of artistry, we've already discussed the problem of music in uh, a lecture which we gave on the last program, so we will uh, not emphasize that phase today, other than to point out the same rules apply. 
and that the selection of a musical life, now greatly enriched and made more dynamic by the high developments of fidelity and things of that nature in good music, that this in turn becomes a challenge on the life of the individual to choose that which is appropriate to his own consciousness and to try at the same time and grow. So we will emphasize especially this morning that type of art most generally associated with the term and that is painting and sculpturing. And we will try to understand the problem as the individual experiences it. The individual naturally progresses from within himself in terms of symbolism. Every human being who has any kind of a psychic integration <coughs> is instinctively a symbolist. From the time when he doodles on the telephone pad to the time that he becomes another Michelangelo, he is a symbolist. He is forever releasing or expressing or exposing something from within himself. Now, a great many persons are not skilled artists. And in a great number also, the instinct to art is not strong enough to dominate other instincts. If this instinct is not strong, it can seldom, if ever, be transformed by learning into genius. But it can be, to a certain degree, released into a condition of pleasant cooperation in living. To simply say I can't draw a straight line and then lose all interest in art is to defeat ourselves. We may not be able to draw a straight line, but did you ever realize that neither can nature? There is not a straight line in the universe. Therefore this does not become so serious a defect as some individuals conceive. There is a rudiment of artistry in the individual that can be released to some degree. When we give children music lessons, there is not one person in 10,000 who has any expectancy that his prodigy will ever achieve greatly on the level of professional music. But we have always felt that music was a civilizing force in the life of the young and in the life of the old even also even though the process of attaining it may approach barbarism at times. <laughs> so we go through this procedure fully convinced that it will ultimately uh, have a maturing effect upon the soul. Today, with the greater increase in leisure, with working hours shorter, with nearly every problem of life brought more and more under an extraordinary efficiency, the possibility of the individual devoting some part of his life to the natural expression of himself uh, should uh, loom strong on the horizon of man's affairs. <coughs> it is perfectly conceivable that everyone can find some form of artistry by which he will be able to increase his own personality integration. Now, one thing that has been held against art and against nearly all avocational artistic interests is that they have a, a tendency to divide families. The individual with a hobby devotes time to that hobby which other members of the family wish to have devoted to themselves. This is true where there's only one hobbyist in the family. But experience has proved to us that the individual who objects to the hobby is usually the one most in need of one. Because he has none of his own. Or he would take the other person's time in which they are engaged in hobbies as a wonderful opportunity to advance his own. But if he has none and is depending totally and completely upon the physical association of someone else, then it can become a highly competitive problem. But there is a hobby in which both families and homes can work together on an artistic level, and that is the home itself, making it a more complete expression of a harmonic integrity of human life. But everyone today needs avocational outlets, 
especially on an artistic or aesthetic level. And if it does not happen that he is able to paint or draw, it may well be that he can have the craft shop or the loom or something whereby he becomes creative. Now this brings us to the keynote of the whole situation on the level of art, namely the frustration of the individual to be creative. In the days of the guilds, the tailor, the merchant, the grocer, the tinsmith, these persons were creators. They took a tremendous personal satisfaction in making something grow or come to usefulness through their ingenuity. They were recognized as leaders in their society because they were creative artisans. Thus they had something we have completely lost, and that is the pride of creativity. Today we must find this again because without it our neurosis will increase. We must release. We cannot allow all of the advantages and opportunities and privileges with which we are surrounded to flow in upon us, be captured within our own minds, emotions, and memories, and there stagnate. Unless we can take what we know and do something with it, it endangers us and creates within us the possibility of abnormalcy and serious uh, psychological and psychiatric problems. This lack of creativity uh, can be best and most easily supplemented or compensated for by a strong development of whatever artistry we have. If we do not feel that we have any artistry at all, that is all the more reason why we should search for some expression by which we increase either in our appreciation of beauty or in our skill, or in some way in which we can contribute self-expression to a life very largely dominated by formulas, formulas in themselves as dull as dishwater, formulas of no value to our psychic integrity. Now, from this art as impulse, we then turn to the concept of art as impact. Just as surely as man feels the need of creativity within himself, so he responds instinctively and inevitably to the creativity of others. Whenever a person looking at something says, I like it, or I don't like it, he is reacting to art as impact. Art as impact is the acceptance through his own sensory perception of the ingenuity, the genius, the sublimity, the symbolism, the moralism which he finds in the things he sees or the sounds he hears, or the buildings where he functions in life or business. Thus everything around us in the world that is the product of human genius and ingenuity becomes a form of art as impact. Art as impact will be found in the parks of our cities, in the public buildings of our communities, the art as impact will be found in the outlines and profiles of our automobiles, the new color combinations on our refrigerators and deep freezers. Everywhere where things have been made colorful, have, made to, have been given good clean line of design, have been made to glitter and to shine, all these things are impact upon the psychic nature of the individual. <laughs> And even commercial art has realized that man has within him a focal point of intensity which does respond, reaches out and tries to grasp that which pleases it. This type of discovery, while on a comparatively low level 
of aesthetics is still factual and indicates much more upon which we can build if we are so minded and desired. So we have around us schools of art, great and not great. And we find that the individual in responding to art is also telling us a great deal about himself. He is telling us of the health and sickness of his own psychic nature and by the way in which he energizes his desires we discover the flow and direction of his libido. Consequently we will observe for instance in a store where a great many goods are offered for sale, art objects of various kinds, knickknacks and decorations. I've talked to a good many proprietors of places of uh, specializing in various types of decorative arts. They all tell me the same thing. The most difficult thing to sell is that which is good. Now that is something that uh, should not be that way. Uh, that which is obvious, uh, that which requires no imagination, uh, that which in itself will soon be of no interest but which is gaudy, sensational, unusual, and sometimes larger than something else. Especially if being larger, it still costs less. <laughs> this determines selection. And so a, an endless stream of gaudy knickknacks flow from merchandise into the abodes of human beings where they must be very little better than small centers of dyspepsia in the community existence. <laughs> now the individual who has them says he likes them. Everyone else wonders why he doesn't care. Because he wonders why they like what they like. And so the wonder grows. This situation is not good when it is as widespread as it is in this country. It represents a serious lack of maturity. It represents a kind of perpetual sub-adolescence because these things are not very different from the comparative toys with which we uh, gladden the soul of the small child at Christmas time. Uh, these toys and the gladness they bring are appropriate to a five-year-old or a six-year-old, but they are not appropriate to mature persons. And the comparative lack of maturity in the appreciation of man tells us much more about him than what he spends. It tells us how he will vote what part he will take in world peace, and very much of how long we must still have wars before men get over them. These simple tastes, or lack of tastes, tell stories, and these stories are bad news. They are not what they should be in a people with the advantages, opportunities, privileges which we have. So we not long ago attended a sale, an auction sale, and the auctioneer got up and opened his auction sale with what I thought was a very good remark. He said, we have a number of pictures here. They've been on exhibition for some time and we've had a number of critics come in and look them over. Obviously, he said, those who knew what these pictures were could not afford to buy them. And those who will buy them will have no knowledge, sense, or appreciation for them anyway, so the sale will now begin. <laughs> now this is something coming from the hardened experience of an individual who has been working in that field for over 30 years. It tells us an experience that is too common to be happy. An experience which must and does point out 
that the individual in his education and in every part of himself has completely ignored his own cultural content and has become concerned only with what he considers economic survival. If the economic struggle has gotten this tough, if it has become such a complete and overwhelming ob obsession of peoples, then it is going to head into its own destruction because nothing can live by bread alone. It must live by something deeper and more beautiful and more wonderful within itself. So Arna's impact tells us what we are by how we react to impact and what constitutes impact. And where we react to that which is not good, where we react to something, as one customer said, picking up a small object, I love it, it's so silly. Now, if that is the basis of affection, they must have an extraordinary group of acquaintances. <laughs> we therefore need, perhaps, specialized training in these fields. And the question always will be how to induce people to take such a training. We can always induce them to take two years secretarial school because they're going to make a living off of it. We can induce them to take up stenotype or something of that nature, or to study for six months to be an office hostess. All these things are practical. But how are we going to get people to do the things that they should do so that they will not get sick? That's been the question the doctors have been asking for a long time, too. Because in the field of healing, there are millions of dollars for recovery and not one nickel for prevention. The individual doesn't care whether he is sick or not until he is sick. Then he doesn't care what caused it as long as he gets over it. And he doesn't care whether he really recovers or not as long as the pain stops. So really sincere problems of remedy have very little opportunity to survive. The economic value of man's aesthetic life is not measured by the fact that after he has taken 2,000 piano lessons, he can give piano lessons at $3 a piece. That is not the value. The value lies in the individual attaining a certain maturity of inner life. Economics as we know them today will not bestow maturity. Our most successful economists are perpetual adolescents. Uh, the maturity of life is not to be brought about even by the sciences and by the high development of our learning or our industrialism or our uh, trade schools and things of that nature. The problem lies on the level of essential culture itself. Without culture, we cannot be healthy. And our lack of it is recognized and registered in our juvenile delinquency, our broken homes, our mental disease, our addiction to extravagant, wasteful, and dangerous habits and the general lack of integration within the personal life of the individual so that he is a victim of the first reverse that strikes him. These are the practical returns. And I believe that we would ultimately realize that culture is an investment. An investment not only in character, but a profound and positive defense against the cost of recovery in almost every field of activity. I know definitely cases in which individuals have spent entire fortunes trying to get over some unhappy and, de and detrimental ailment when that ailment could probably have been prevented in the beginning by a few hundred dollars worth of cultural education. So there are definite and positive values involved in these things. And we need these values very desperately. And sometimes we are a little bit uh, discouraged by the fact that those persons who should be most aware of this, students of comparative religion, 
philosophy and uh, the great creative, mystical, and esoteric subjects, that these are among the worst offenders in this particular, because they have become so much interested in their notions and their ideas and in their doctrines and their beliefs that they have not reserved any part of their means or their time for the simple aesthetic pursuits which they have come to regard as almost uh, below their level of attention. This is distinctly wrong and is the reason perhaps why we have so many debates and so little understanding on the levels of knowledge because the individual becomes learned without becoming a lover of beauty and without giving beauty an opportunity to express itself through his life. Where this happens, there is a deformity in the soul. And where such deformities exist, discord, dissension, disillusionment, discouragement, and all these are not far off. Now in the field of art as impact, we also have many levels of artistic appreciation. One of the things that the average person learns if he becomes interested in art is that his art instincts grow. We may have various mementos around us that are associated with us throughout life through some pleasant, intimate, or personal emotional attachment. Those are one uh, types of art, usually of no great value in themselves, but valuable because they remind us of something, recall something to our minds for which we have some deep regard or remembrance. These are of one order, but in the level of art itself, the individual should grow. The person unskilled and untutored in art cannot become immediately learned because art must first of all please you. The proof of art is the fact that the individual is rejoicing in himself because of it. I've talked with some very great art experts as to what constituted for the individual a great work of art. They are all of the same opinion, that the term great is completely personal and relative, that that which is satisfactory to the person who beholds it is for him art. Therefore, three little holes on the front of a stone make an attractive portrait for some primordial or aboriginal native whereas the same would not be so acceptable to us until through a vast amount of unfoldment and development we become primordial again and pay a fancy price for the same stone with the same three holes in it uh, achieved and perfected by a modern sculptor. <laughs> now the difference between an African primitive and a Parisian primitive is very great. The African primitive is honest. It is the natural instinct of a people releasing from itself its own dream of beauty. To us it may be a little bit uh, not beautiful, but it has a tremendous impact of integrity. But when a piece of this kind is copied as the result of a group of French artists sitting around in the cupole or the dome in Paris, uh, drinking absinthe. And when this piece is copied by a decadent modern, it is not art anymore. It isn't honest. It was honest when the primitive man made the three little holes in the stone and called it a face. There is something tremendous in his dream, his vision, the entire impact of his consciousness. But when a modern man, knowing better, does these things, it is not art. This we have to learn sometime to realize. And that these arts which are not honest can never serve the common good of man. 
But assuming that the person is simply unskilled but honest in his mind, he may choose some comparatively insignificant and actually unmeritorious work and say, I like it. If he does, it is for him. For it is not only answering a longing within him, but it is telling us the story of the level of his own appreciation, or the level of the value on which he is able to function. This impact is a complete diagnosis of something. It tells us not only what he likes in art, it tells us how he will face life, how he treats his family, or how his endocrine system is, how he will work with other men in an office, what his probable religious ideals will be, and about how much defense he has against the nervous breakdown or stomatic ulcers. All this is told by this statement of his, I like it. It is telling us a great deal about that person. If, however, he is a honest, natural person, he will take what he likes and take it home and cherish it. And then about six months later it will disappear. Why? Because he has learned the lesson of it. Because the psychic content in man, like every other part of him, is never satisfied. It must grow. As soon as he has become accustomed to a thing, the moment it ceases to challenge him, he becomes indifferent to it. It is like the person who just couldn't live without that new car until he got it. Two weeks later, he doesn't even take care of it. Once he has it, either as a possession or as a level of consciousness, it loses interest for it. Therefore, he will be impelled, if he is normal and natural, to reach further. And the next time he says, I like it, the object of his liking will be a little more advanced a little better. For it may happen that having secured his first piece of art, good, bad, or indifferent, he had an experience which he recognized as psychologically significant. Therefore, perhaps he took read a book on the subject for the first time, or decided he would go and attend a, cl a class on art appreciation, or perhaps he went down uh, to some friend of his who was an artist and had a little chat with him about these things. Something stirred in him, and he started. And once he started, there is no end. For after he had gotten through with that particular impact, he began to think more about it, just as the musician, the music appreciation person, does not start by a full and complete appreciation for Beethoven, but he can grow to it, gradually. And it is never his while a friend of, him, of his tells him he must appreciate Beethoven. That is not the answer. It must come from within himself, in his own solitude, in his own quietude, and without pressure of any kind. He must slowly begin to appreciate. And as he appreciates, he will make his own selections. And it is this in art also. And a person who has started to have a certain instinct in that direction will in ten years make many changes in his attitudes and will gradually begin to reveal a selectivity of appreciation. Now this is what we finally discover. Your great artists, particularly your great connoisseurs of art, these individuals that we, we may term highbrows because we do not understand them. But the great leaders who have developed the greatest appreciation or the greatest soul receptivity to art as impact are all of the same mind. Because when they reach a certain degree of excellence, they come to a common appreciation. For they realize that they are approaching the substance of pure beauty and that the great master works of the world are the most thinly veiled representations of this pure quality of absolute excellence. Such works are rare, and very few may ever own them. But those who understand them, 
and many who have understood them well have never owned them. Those who have this appreciation can turn to an Italian tapestry or a Chinese painting, and if it is of that level of internal excellence, revealing that quality of creative consciousness on the part of the artist, it will be equally acceptable as impact. So those who have achieved these levels also show to us that they have moved through the complexities of art and that the great art of the world is nearly all very simple. That it is pure motion and design that it is consciousness with as little a form associated with it as is possible to its existence in a formal world. So we go to the great art of China, the great arts of India, the great arts of Greece and Egypt, and essentially they are all the same. We can take a superlative example of Chinese art and put it alongside of a superlative example of Greek art, and it may be very difficult for even the expert to tell the countries the two came from. Because as the nation itself, he, as the Chinese art, is artist and art connoisseur, increased in his understanding, he became international. He was no longer bound by tradition and by the cultures of his own people. I have seen carvings from the caves of the third and fourth uh, century in China which when compared to certain of the cave carvings of approximately the same time, type and kind in India, there is essentially no difference. And a fine example of the Gandhara carvings or the central Indian carvings or the paintings of Ajanta when compared to Greek frescoes or Roman frescoes, you can hardly distinguish between them. The only clue is the costuming, which is to a certain degree local. But the artistry, the genius, is universal. So great art is one of the most wonderful points of union. We grow through all kinds of different art styles until we approach pure art, which is the master style. And when we reach that, we are again in unity. And this experience is tremendously important to the individual. It helps him to grow and to express himself continuously. We know that the individual is nourished through his eyes and through his ears, almost as much as through his mouth. The mouth may nourish the body, but the ears and the eyes nourish the soul. And therefore, the constant association of the individual with certain standards set up by himself for the civilization of himself, this association brings with it a subconscious uh, growth, a subconscious enrichment of character. We know, for example, that during the war, when we wanted to have some of our young men learn languages very quickly, <coughs> we simply used phonograph recordings, which we played at a very low tone, constantly, where these young men were. They were these records were played when the young men were not studying, but they were language records, constantly played and replayed, while these men were doing other things, eating, sleeping, doing anything that they were doing. But as a result of this tonal pattern, continuously repeated in the background, and the instructions constantly reaffirmed, these young men learned languages with a phenomenal speed, many achieving in a few months what under normal conditions would have required years. Therefore, we cannot say that these tonal patterns in the background, even though we may not be listening to them, are not tremendously vital in the conditioning of consciousness. And the same is true of works of art. A beautiful work of art hanging on the wall of a house can become a minister of civilization in that house. A few fine things which the individual associates, associates with will constantly
constantly preach to him, teach him, inspire him. He will not know when they speak or how they speak, but he will feel better. He will also discover certain changes in his own moral life. I was talking with quite a fine art connoisseur not long ago, and we were talking about a piece of art which he was taking or planning to take home with him, some piece that had come into his possession. And he said, I'm a little worried about this. It is a magnificent thing, but I'm a little afraid of it. I'm afraid that I'm not worthy of it. And if I'm not, I'm afraid it will make me unhappy. I think it will make me grow faster than I can, or give me a problem. Because, he said, if I take a piece of art like this into my house and place it in a room, I turn that room over to that piece of art. From that time, it will tell me what it will endure and what it will not endure. It will tell me, I will not take those window curtains and take them out. Or it will say to me, I can't stand the rug. Or it will say to me, I don't like the other pieces of art you have. Get rid of them. And every time I come in, it may say to me, you are a pretty honoring, no good character, aren't you? I don't like you. <laughs> that in six months I will be under the tyranny of that piece of art. And the only way I can ever escape it, there are two ways. I can remove the art, and then it will remain in my memory to haunt me, and to rouse me at night and say, ha-ha, you couldn't take me, could you? <laughs> or else he said, I must suddenly become a much greater person than I am, so that that piece of art will be happy. It is alive. It has a ministry. It has a majesty which uh, will not permit it to be accepted easily or tossed aside or become an insignificant part of the background. These things are strong. And the individual must be himself strong to live with them because they challenge every weakness in him and make him ashamed of himself day and night. Now those are the kinds of thinkings we have from people who are far advanced in this type of thing. Much, more, much further advanced than most of us are. But they tell us that there is a tremendous dynamic in these problems. And that if man wants to build a good world, he must build a beautiful world. Because it's his own beauty that he confers upon it that will help to make it good. He must do the same thing in his own life. And in these things, uh, art is therapy. Because art can drive man mad. It can also pick him up from the depths of a mania and put him back on his feet again. Art is a therapy to the nerves, to the psychic nature of the individual. Art is counseling because it tells the person without the common use of words what is right and what is wrong. Art inspires and lifts, it comforts in time of sorrow and loss. It is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And it can inspire the person to make great and wonderful changes in his own life, changes toward health, toward normalcy, towards peace of soul. Therefore, it, it seems to me that it should be regarded as a vital agent in therapy. That when we see persons who are unhappy, confused, disordered in their thinking, that it might be well to take a peek at their environment and see whether they are punishing themselves, trying desperately to hold on to things they have outgrown, or whether perhaps they have outstripped themselves on some single item which is too strong for their own use at that time. More likely, however, they have outgrown and are now unhappy living with the ghosts of ideals and standards which are no longer helpful or protective. Art has, then, a tremendous twofold mission. First, to release the person, to give him a constructive, dynamic, personal existence in which he becomes like uh, 
Pygmalion, the designer of a thing that will come to life. It gives him release. And it also draws from him. Because of the greatness of the art of the world, it inspires. And in this way, draws from him locked values and qualities. As impact, it breaks up crystallization within him. As impulse, it inspires him to release himself. And these two ministries have made art the handmaiden of religion since the beginning of the world. And every human being who has ever sought to grow has also groped after beauty and tried to find some constructive, proper method of expressing it. These realizations are important today on a level of therapy. And just as we are exploring music to find the tones and the rhythms which will be most useful to help the individual, so we must explore line, color, and composition and discover, as the Egyptians knew, that certain basic symbols, like the Oriental mandalas and things of that nature, are distinct and definite therapies that they can be used and that the individual placed in an artistic environment suited to his immediate need can find in his own art therapies instruments of recovery that will help him to reintegrate and to grow. And the wonderful thing about these qualities uh, is that they are natural to man, that he instinctively rejoices in them. They are not dangerous chemicals from which he may have to recover. They are simple methods of relaxing, unwinding, unknotting the complicated skein of human life and by which relaxation, organization, and integration are restored. And the person is a better parent, a better uh, friend, a better worker in the various levels and capacities of his daily existence. So we do strongly recommend the concept of art as a therapy, and that the individual can experiment with this in a very simple way, he can take a book of good pictures or good arts of various nations. He will also find instinctive interest in the arts of certain peoples and times. He will look down through these pages and suddenly he will stop. That one pleases him. He has found something he likes. And as soon as this emotion strikes him, as soon as this instinct hits, let him sit down and work out why. Let him decide as he can what has struck him, whether it is form or color or design, whether it is a pleasant expression or a noble concept. Find out why. And in this way he will be finding out why he is, how his own consciousness is working. And he will also have valuable keys to every phase of organization of his life into future patterns of productiveness. He will also gradually want to enjoy the presence of art. He will want to enjoy association with it. He will become discriminating. And gradually art will lead him, like the muses, into a nobler pattern of life and conduct. All these things are important. They are health-bringing, life-giving, soul-warming. And in this rather difficult time, we need these forces to help us to face the future with a good hope. Time is up.